share with you. Let me give you an overview real quickly of what I'd like to get accomplished. Because at the end of what we do here, um, we've got a lot of our staff that are going to stay. So if you have individual questions about your lives or your loved ones' lives, that's when we'll do that. I don't think it's appropriate to stand up in front of everyone and talk about other people, okay? So what we'll do is go, we will stay as long as we need to, to to get that done, because I know that that's why some of you have come, and, and we will make sure that we do that, okay? But we're gonna go through and talk about what's going on in the agency, basically. I wanna get into detail, some of our expert expert uh, our expert folks are going to talk about iConnect, which is the new technology that is coming on. We're also going to talk about NGQSI, which is the, the new generation QSI, which is really, really, really important. Uh, and so we're going to talk about some of that, and then the waiver and what the legislature did, and then have some questions. I've already talked with a couple of people that not talking about a specific person, but has specific issues that would apply to everyone, and those are important things for us to, to know about. But first of all, the governor, as you all know, or maybe you don't know, he's coming tomorrow uh, at 10.30, uh, made arrangements in his schedule to make sure that he could be here. You know, he has hit the ground running uh, he really has uh, from the day he was elected. And so we feel very fortunate that he's going to be here. And I think once he gets here and he sees and, and mingles with some of you all, um, it, it can make a big difference. I think it's very important um, that not just with the governor, but with legislators, you, and I will talk about that, that you all let them know what's going on in your lives. It's very important. But he wanted me, because he's not going to have time to do it, I think he just at first may not be able to be here, but Andrew Ensinger, where is he? Andrew? Okay, there's Andrew. Andrew has been, the governor wanted me to recognize him, that he has worked for almost three years uh, with the uh, supported living coach, Larry Elmore, with we're floor and deck floor in Orlando. And this is his, his coach. And we want to just applaud you so much for what you've done. Thank you. And we'll get some pictures afterwards. How many other people have been employed for a year or two? Any other? Raise your hand. Awesome. You all have a big round of Before we get started with any of the other stuff, I have something special that I would like to share with you. About, well, I guess it was, uh, I don't know, six months ago, Paul totally came and made a presentation to our staff. And I think it is extremely important, and I don't ever do this, but I thought it was important to share this with you. So I would like Paul, if you would come up here for a minute, and we're just going to take 10 minutes for you to see something we think can be life-saving. Thank you for having me, Greg Palmer. Give you a little bit about me real quick. Uh, my background's FBI. I work on a specialized canine team called the Human Center Evidence Team. Prior to that, I actually worked in several agencies in Florida serving individuals uh, of Florida. When I got through my team with the Bureau, Missing persons, elopements were really on my heart. We created a business and we actually took that process and broke it down and we created a new and improved process for finding missing persons. How many in here have dealt with someone that has gone missing, eloped? It's one of the most traumatic experiences you can deal with. How many of you have a way to prepare for that? You do now. It's a very simple thing, and I'm going to just take you through it really quick, and then we're going to show you a video from a mother who has a special needs child and what the program is doing uh, across the United States. So, 
And we have Rex the Rescue Club. We actually have a real life Rex, and he's named in honor of my boss from the FBI, Rex Stockham, who uh, passed away from cancer he received from 9 11. He was the first agent to the Oklahoma City bombing and the second one to the Pentagon. So we named everything in his honor. So we have all of these things here, and we actually do emergency plans for missing persons cases. Our card actually, our kit actually has a card in there that tells you as a caregiver what to do. We prepare, we prepare for everything else, you know, emergency wise, but we don't do it for this. And it's actually, guess right now, how many people are missing in the United States as we're standing right here? Right now. 5,000? Try 90,000. Any given day of the year, there's 90,000 reported. We're calling it the size of disaster. So, we're really looking at the process and trying to improve that. We thank you, Director Palmer, for having us here today to give you this information. We're, we have sheriff's offices in Florida that are working with us, uh, Sumter, Highlands, Marion, several law, other law firms in Florida. So I want to show you one quick video, and I'll be around for questions. We have some kids and all that if you want to uh, talk with us a little bit later. But our uh, time is of the essence. But thank you for having us. It's an honor to be here today. If you'll cue up that video for us. Very prone to wandering or elopement. Um, it's a huge problem with many families who have children on the spectrum. Um, he's he's driven by something inside him to wander off. And you know, it's he doesn't feel like, oh, where's mom? I need to go find her, or oh, where's you know, where's my sister? I haven't seen her in a minute. You know, he He'll see something that he wants to go and look at, and he'll just take off that direction. And we could be at a park, and he could be headed to the street. You know, we could be at a store, and he could be heading, you know, out the emergency exit. There's, there's not really a way to predict what things are going to catch his attention. So the only thing we can do is to be constantly vigilant. And you know, when we're in a big crowded place, never to take our hand off his wrist, or never to, you know, let go of his hand. If we're at home, we have to keep locks on the doors, and we have to put in a code in order to unlock them from the inside, because otherwise he'll unlock that bolt and be out you know, the door. And um, we can't let him play in the backyard by himself because he'll jump on the fence and run away. Um, and we discovered this a couple of months ago when that's exactly what happened. He waited until he watched to see if we were otherwise occupied. I was crafting with my daughter. My parents were in town, and um, mom was washing dishes, and dad was sitting in the living room and keeping an eye on him. And Jameson waited until we were all looking in some other direction and was able to jump the fence and take off to the park. And the park um, where I live has a big spring in it, and, and it's, you know, it's big and deep and fast. And he was getting into the water when another family there saw him and um, you know called him kind of over to them and helped him put his clothes back on and you know all of that. And by that point, of course, you know, we were frantically searching the house and then I called the police and my dad had taken off in his car to go drive the neighborhood and see if they could find him. Um, the police called me back um, about 90 seconds after I got off the phone with him and saying, okay, they found him, he's in the park, and so we went and met him, and the officers there, they met us there in the park um, with Eli, and Eli is the trailing dog um, that, he, that they, the police officers got from Send Up and Canine, and he's been trained brilliantly to, um, to find people by scent, and I can't, if there was a way for me to communicate to you the sort of, the overwhelming emotion of learning that not only is, is there this, this help, this, this option um, around, like out in the world, you know, but, but right here, right where I need it. Um, I've lived in this town for about a year, and it's been, it's been tough. Um, I'm a really single mom, and trying to keep my kids safe 
without much of a social network, without you know any of that, has been a struggle. And um, I've looked into in the past wondering if there was a way to train a service dog for my son, um, specifically to be able to track him if he runs away, or, or even to bark if he starts taking off. You know, but they're only like twelve thousand dollars a month, and I I can't afford that. You know, and. And it's just, it's, it's crushingly awful feeling like the only thing standing between your son and tragedy is your own infallibility. Because I'm not infallible, you know? And I do my best every single day. But my best is still a human best, you know? My best is one person doing their best. And when I was standing there with the two officers and they were telling me about what it is that Eli can do, and you know, telling me about they, they told me about someone that he had found that he tracked him over like 70, 72 or seventy three hours, and that he could he could trail someone through even if he got into a vehicle and drove off, and it was just I was sort of crying because I'm not in the book, you know, like. Eli being there in my town doesn't change my routine. It doesn't. It doesn't make it any less important for me to keep the doors locked or for me to, you know, keep my hand entwined with Jay swimming across the street or anything like that. What it changes is I no no longer the only barrier between my son and being lost forever. You know, I'm no longer having to go this alone because it's no longer just up to me that. There is someone who can help, and honestly, this is this is perhaps the the most life changing um, news. Even though it doesn't change the routine, it changes the anxiety level. It changes the 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 crushing anxiety and weight of um, just feeling alone in it. You know, and, and that's difficult to express because it sounds really cliche and it doesn't sound like it should be that big of a deal because, you know, y'all aren't, y'all aren't going to be coming in and helping me, you know, make sure that he, he has enough to eat and making sure that he, you know, gets enough rest and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, whenever someone is neurotypical, a lot of the time our, our society's infrastructure is already built to keep you safe because you already, you know, in general, you understand some of the, the basic, um, what are, what's that word, the default settings of how to be safe in our society. Because our society is set up for people who are neurotypical. And Jameson is not neurotypical. And he has, he has needs that can't be met by the normal mainstream society. And so all of those default settings that allow parents and neurotypical children to turn their attention to um, you know higher Maslow's needs, you know, things that, that aren't just about security and that aren't just about your basic survival, you know. Everybody needs help. Every parent needs help. And when the structure of our society is is set up to help you meet those basic needs then you can turn your attention to higher ones. But with Jameson, it's it's the exceptional things and the outliers and the um, it's the people going above and beyond that make his life safe. And I really hope that in my horrible rambling way that I've been able to express to you just how much you and what you do goes above and beyond in helping families like mine and people like my son be safe. And I know that you help a lot of families that deal with other things, but for this specific issue, this this one thing, this whole world is better because of what you do. And I hope that I hope that I hope that I can adequately communicate my gratitude for the work that you put into what you do.
they need it. So uh, he'll be around afterwards if you all want to talk with him. Uh, please do. And if you know other people that, that need this, certainly the elderly as well. Um, so anyway, okay. Now, where's my sheet? There it is. Okay, let's talk about what's going on in the agency. You know, yesterday, um, President uh, Galvano talked about the appropriation that the legislature did this past year. It was about $50 million. But let me tell you what that $50 million goes for. It goes for those individuals that have significant additional needs that are already on the way, which is called SAMS. It also is going to go for people that are in crisis, that are on the waiting list. And right now we have about 35,000 people that are on the waiting list, and about 21,000 that are on the waiting list. Half of the people on the waiting list, though, if they're under 21, and there's about 9,000 of them, if they're Medicaid eligible, will be served by the Agency for Healthcare Administration, ACA. Okay, so when you look at the wait list, the wait list is not really 21,000, it's more like around 10 uh, of people that would qualify. But do you think we need more money? Yes. yes. Okay, because let me tell you the other scary thing about this. When you talk about significant additional needs, okay, that is somebody that's already on the way. What's happened in the past is, and we we finally communicated this with the legislature and they've asked us to take a look at what we're doing to see if we can redesign it so it will be more efficient and be better. Because what's happening right now is let's say somebody comes off the, the wait list at age 24 and their service needs for the things that they have, let's say it's $20,000. Two years later, one of their parents gets sick, and now they need additional support, in home supports, and it goes up to 30,000, okay? And then let's say five years later, one of the parents dies, and now maybe they have to put the person in a group home, just using this as an example, and now we're up to 70,000 dollars. So they started out at 20, and now they're at 70. That 20 to 70 has not been funded by the legislature, okay? And that's why this agency has continued to go into a deficit. So this governor is asking us in the legislature, is asking us to take a look at that. How do we solve that problem? And I will tell you the truth, the reason why I wanted to stay in this job is because I want to solve this problem. This has been the problem with this agency from the very beginning. And yes, we need more money, but we also need to look at how we're doing this. And so what we're doing is we are looking at all these other states. How are you doing different things? And we're gonna take best practices from other states and see if we can do some things that are gonna stretch our dollars a little farther and, and, and be able to take a look at services that maybe can be Fine. Let's make it easier for providers, too, to be able to do things. Uh, so that's what we're doing this year. And we have to have that report to the legislature by September. So you know we've got a lot of work to do. A lot of work. Um, so today, what I want to do when we get to it is get you to give us ideas of things that you think we can do to improve the system that we have. Now you know that they're gonna look for cost-cutting initiatives too, but cost-cutting doesn't necessarily have to mean less services. We've gotta look at ways of doing things differently. If you keep doing things the same way, you're gonna get the same results. And so I wanna keep an open mind to different ways of, of providing services um, and looking at what other people are doing. But before we get into any of that, and then we're going to have you all can ask whatever questions you want to ask. I do want uh, Shima Ma to please come up. Now, I connect 
How many of you have heard about iConnect? Okay. So how many of you have not heard about iConnect? Uh, it's about just about the same number. This is probably the most significant thing that's going to happen as far as technology. It is not probably. It is the most significant thing that's going to happen to this agency and for you all. Uh, because it's bringing us into the 21st century. You know, right now, everything's on paper. And it, we don't have a central client database. You, as a parent, or a guardian, or a self-advocate, really can't even look at information online about your services, about any of those things. You're going to be able to do that. You'll be able to see what services you get, who's delivered those services, all of those things, okay? And for providers, what it means is when the waiver support coordinator comes and meets with you and you determine what your service needs are, they can immediately authorize those services online and the services can be delivered to care. Okay? We're, I mean, we're, we're in the dark ages right now. Now, in order to do this, We've, it's a lot of work because we have to process map every single thing that we do. So Sheila is going to explain to you where we are in the process and when things might be rolling out. She's been doing all of our training and I, I just can't say enough about Sheila and, and all the wonderful things she's doing. Sheila, you want to come up and spend some time? Sheila. Practices, 
and the significant additional needs requests, those kinds of things. And so right now what we're doing is we are testing all of those new functionalities. And when I say testing, we're testing it, we're retesting it, and then we're testing it against more. We are also getting ready to roll out our training for this, this next phase. We actually have some folks here from the regions that are part of our training team. They're the ones that are going to stand up in front of our staff and our waiver support coordinators in your regions and share with them how to do these new functionalities, things that they currently do on paper, in their own system, or through iPad. All of those types of things are going to be coming into iPad. And we will be starting our training with our staff in just a little over a week. We start on June 16th with our staff. So this is, this is coming and we're very excited. We're also looking at beginning to transition our providers. Because as I said, rollout two is for waiver support coordinators and APD staff. Starting in the, the winter of this year, we will start bringing providers into iConnect. Now, when you think about all of the providers that we have in the agency, we can't bring them all at once. As much as everyone wants to get in and get busy with it, we really want to make sure that people have time to come in and learn, our staff have time to work with them. So we are also doing a phased implementation with our providers. And we will be bringing in, again, limited, limited functionalities for the providers so that like the support coordinators, they have time to get familiar with it. They're going to have questions. You're going to have questions for them. You're going to be asking, how does this affect any of the services, should I notice if my providers are now working in my community? Those kinds of things. They'll be looking at their own provider record management, but also the documentation that they do when they deliver services for you and your, and your family members, that's also going to be happening in iConnect in that same client central record or consumer central record that the support coordinator has been working in. It's all going to be in one place. And everybody that works with you or your loved one is going to be able to access that information so that they can better support and help plan for the service needs for your family. Because we are doing this, this rolling implementation, it's likely that it won't be until about 2021 before we have all of our providers in. And then once we have all of our providers in and they're successfully using iConnect, then the next phase that we'll be looking at is the consumer caregiver report. Now, how many of you access your medical records or schedule appointments with your doctors online? Right? I mean, that's definitely the way that we're going. And, and so I don't want to say that iConnect is going to be exactly like that, but there will be a portal for the consumer or the legal representative to be able to access parts of their record. The support plan. Right now, the support coordinator provides you with that support plan, but if you, if you lost your copy, you would be able to go and get a copy of the support plan and other documents like that. We're still working on the development and the configuration of that, so there will be over the next year or so more information coming for that, but get excited because again, I, I'm an electronic person. I like to just go and get my information. I don't want to have to call someone and say, can you email it to me? I just want to get it. So you're going to be able to do that. These are examples of some of the things that we're looking at having be available for you as we work on our, our configuration ports. And again, as I said, this is going to ensure that you guys have access to information. This is going to help you better direct the services and supports for your person, your, your family member, or for yourself even. Um, and as the director said, we're coming into the 21st century. Just some more information about increased self-determination and those kinds of things. But I will be around later if you have any questions or want to talk a little bit more about it. But I really appreciate the opportunity this afternoon to just come and tell you about what's coming because these are exciting times. Thank you. I know for things, uh, time is getting by. Uh, and I want to make sure that you all have time for questions and comments and things like that. But I do want uh, Clarence Lewis to come up and talk about the new generation of QSI. And the reason why this is, Sheila, thank you very much. And there, there's a lot more involved in, in the iConnect thing, as you can imagine. But um, uh, it's going to be extremely exciting when it comes out. Uh, Clarence, come on up. Clarence uh, is deputy 
By the way, Sheila, what is your exact title? I don't even know. Organizational Change Management and Training Manager. <laughs> the IConnect Organizational Change Management and Training Manager. See why I don't know that? <laughs> and so we've got a deputy director right here that is going to, he's in our state office now, and he's going to talk about NGQSI. And you all know, does everybody here know how important QSI is? Yes. yes. Well, so let me tell you something. The QSI, as good as it was, did not have a lot of the information we needed. A lot. And so this generation uh, is going to be extremely comprehensive, and uh, he's going to tell you about where we are with it, and maybe if you've got questions, you can get down there. Okay. Well, good afternoon. We passed out the handout so you can kind of follow along on this. QSI. Do you know what QSI stands for, first of all? Does anybody know? Thank you. Questionnaire Situation Information. And what the agency is doing is gathering information that can be used in support plan process. Actually, the agency started using the QSI back in 2009. It's been 10 years with the original QSI. And one of the things we learned over this process is that we needed to improve it. And as you look at the document that's been passed around there, you'll see that uh, how we're going about to develop our new, what we call NG QSI or next generation QSI. One of the striking things about this new next QSI is it will be automated. As Sheila was just explaining to you, that in the director as well, is that the agency has lagged behind keeping up with technology. If you've undergone a QSI, you would have noticed that the assessor was writing down everything that uh, the information that you provided to them. Well, with the next generation QSI, they'll be able to put it directly input into their laptop, and that information will automatically go what they call to the cloud or iCloud, okay? Now, the next generation QSI focuses on five domains. Support and services, wellness and health and maintenance, daily living skills, and life skills, value roles, and social interaction, as well as uh, behavior concerns. The original QSI, if you notice, primarily focused on uh, functional, physical, and behavior action. But with this yeah. next generation, we're trying to dig a little bit deeper so we get a better understanding of uh, the individual's needs. We will continue to practice the self-centered, personal-centered interview process. And because we all are a little bit different, right? And so we have to focus on that individual. And family members, the, the consumer or the client themselves, or their service supports will be able to provide information that will help. Here, here, here's the goal with the next generation QSI. We're trying to get, to get a better understanding of individuals' support needs. We want to assess and promote social integration for that particular individual. One of the things that the next generation QSI will also do as the assessor is completing it, they will auto, this is the automation part of this, it will automatically send alerts 
to the support coordinator and to APD staff. For instance, if there was a health issue, um, the system will automatically send an alert. So we will know that an individual, for whatever reason, may have some risk factors that we really need to consider immediately. And the goal there is really to help individuals not undergo any hardship, illness, or harm that could do, have an impact on them. It will, the next generation QSI will also aid us in allocating resources to meet the needs of the individual. We heard Director Palmer talk about some legislators. One of the things that we constantly do throughout the year is provide feedback to our legislators. And by having this automatic system, it's going to allow us and provide us with data that they need in order, because let's be honest, this is all about resources, right? And so the legislators need to know and plan budget-wise when they allocate funding for certain programs across the state. So it's really important. The other thing I just want to hit on quickly is how we came about developing this. Well, we reached out to all stakeholders across the state who have provided feedback, suggestions, on how we can improve the original QSI. We've taken that information and have begun the process of studying Conducting a study, I should say, um, to create this next generation of QSI. Now, whenever you do a development of a new assessment tool, it has to be studied. Because it has to measure what it's intended to measure, right? And so we're just in the first phase of this. And probably within the next week, we're going to complete the first 1,000 88 of these. And then we will turn, share this information to, with Florida State University, who will do the reliability and validity test, testing part of this. So we're just in the beginning stages. Now, throughout the remainder of this year, and probably most of, of next year, uh, we will retest. Our goal is by 2021 is to have a valid assessment tool that we can use uh, across all clients, across all times to improve their lives. And with that, I'll just say, if you have any questions about it, uh, feel free to approach me afterwards. Thank you. talking about this is, well, you know, maybe it's only going to be as good as the assessor, you know? So what do we do about that? So part of what we're doing there is we're making sure that the assessors pass a very, very, very rigorous uh, test. They go through training and so on and testing, and if they fail, they don't get to do it. And we've had a few people fail, um, but not many. So, and, and the testing is, from, from their standpoint, is making sure that each assessor will assess the same way, no matter who the person is, okay? And that's really important. This is a very, this is the most important thing that, that can happen to you as an individual, because it is the assessment of your needs. It's the beginning of every single thing that we do for the future for you. It's not to say that it is going to be perfect, but it's going to be a lot better than it is now. And one of the things that's going to help us deal with the legislature is to be able to say, one of the things, I'll give you an example, that wasn't in the other QSI. 
that is now in this one is, what is the age of the caregiver? You know, you've got to be looking at what's happening. You know, when are people going to need more services because their caregiver is getting older? I mean, those are the kind of things that were not in the other one that are in this one that I want to be able to go downtown and say, look, we got a 57% increase in caregivers that are going to age out and blah, 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 okay? Those are the kind of things to be able to project the amount of money we're going to need going forward because life is changing. And so that's why this is so very important and, and we're taking it seriously. And the Navy sounds crazy it's going to be until 2021, but the truth of the matter is it's got to be done right. And that's what we're doing. The same thing with IPNAC. It's got to be done right. And one of the good things with the contract that we have, uh, with the vendor that we're working with, it's not based on, on IPNAC, it's not based on a time period where, okay, by this day, we, we're finished and we go to the next phase and we go to the next phase. Uh, somebody a lot smarter than me that negotiated this contract said this is based on deliverables, based on whether or not. That's why the testing and all this stuff is so important because I'm very involved in this and I'm telling you right now, we're not going to step two until step one is done right. Because a lot of agencies fail in their IT initiatives because they don't stay on top of it or because they have not structured the contract right. So, but that's enough of that stuff. But I, I'm telling you these things so you can see the future. You can see where we're going with this agency. Finally, we're growing up. And we're growing up for you. It's about time. Now, I need you to do something. I said this last night, but I'm going to tell you again how important this is. We are at a quite crossroads in this agency. I'm not exaggerating. We're redesigning. The legislature's really scrutinizing what's going on. Okay? And by the way, they're going to be making some big, big decisions. And we've got to lay out every single option there is. And we're going to have to do that by September. So over the summer, we're going to be putting all of this together, and then I'm going to be going out into the state, talking with legislators, and so on and so forth. At that point in time, we're going to give you all information through our, whether it's uh, any, through social media. Okay, in the best way we know how. But we need you to go see your legislators. I'm not kidding you when I tell you this. This is so very, very important. Because I can go in there and say whatever, but you can go in there and tell the story about your life and about why you need these services. And, and those of you that have already gotten the SANS, you can say, if this didn't happen for me, this is what my life would be like. Okay? Or you go in and say, I've been on the wait list now for so long and I've not been able to get it, and here's my situation, and they need to understand it. Not just, you know, you go in. How many of you would be willing to do that? Okay, because thank you.
director, I would even I would even encourage people to meet you when you go around to their local legislature so that you and the individual are there together. And not only are you sharing it from the state's perspective, but the individual will be able to share it from their own perspective. And we'd be happy to do that for you. Yes, I mentioned that in something. I can't remember where it was when I mentioned that. But I do want to do that. I wonder where it was. It was at the Florida Association of Rehabilitation Facilities Board of Directors meeting. Uh, I was telling them the same thing. We're going to do this, and that when I come, I want to get with providers and people that they serve, and we can go in together and talk about things. Um, so, yes, I agree with you. I, I do want to do that. So, Dora Booty, Dora, you want to stand up a second? Dora Booty, who is my right arm, and left arm, and right foot, and everything. You know, she's uh, she is going to be coordinating this for me. So some of you may be getting a call. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me do it another way. I'm going to do it another way. Here, don't blow this. <laughs> okay, anybody that is willing to do this, I want you to send her an email. Okay, and. And she's going to keep track of where you live and all that, and we're going to see if we can't coordinate it that way, okay? Because it's easier than me trying to figure out who it is I can get you. But you've got to be willing now to get it going there and you be as, as this as I am, okay? Because it's that important. Okay, so the, her email is... Write this down. Get a pad and pencil. Everybody ready? Okay, it's D O R I A. It's Doria. We call it Dora. D O R I A dot Moody, M O O D Y, at a P D Cares dot org. Okay? So I'm hoping when you get back your whole email will be blown up and we'll coordinate stuff and we'll have a good time. We'll have fun with this. Because it's 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 important. This would be for when I go out throughout the state and we go into the district offices of these people and talk to them there. Okay? That's what this is about. Yeah. And let me, Jeff, you stand up. Look at Jeff. Jeff's going, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Jeff Bobby is our legislative affairs director. He's going to be working with Dora to make sure all these legislators are going to be there when we get there. And he's going, oh my God. <laughs> but he can do it. I know he can. I know he can. Uh, so, I would like the other APD staff to stand up, please. Most of them are over here, but I think there might be some other places. Uh, and please get the